right, welcome back in to Content is for Closers. We've got a very exciting episode this week. Carlton, thanks for joining us. How are you doing this week? Man, we're doing good. It's uh, February somehow already. Um, so I'm just really looking forward to uh, 2 2 2 2 2 when that shows up on the calendar at 2 22 p.m. I think that, oh, 2 22 p.m. I mean, it's on a Tuesday. That was yesterday. Well, there's there's two and then 22, so the 22nd, which is oh, going to be right, closer right. to when this airs. Yes, that's true. Uh, how are how are your um, New Year's resolutions going in one twelfth of the the year or New Year's goals? Maybe is a better. Way yeah, I think it. maybe we'll just stick with the two theme, and I've maybe kept to two of them. <laughs> yeah, I've uh, actually, yeah. Likewise, you've you've uh, for our internal rocks that we've been doing. I feel like you've been making progress on more than. Yeah, that. maybe that's why. Maybe I, all of my personal ones have gone to the garbage can because of that, but. <laughs> No, how about you? Are you are you keeping to your New Year's resolutions? I'm I'm making progress on them. I've talked about this with several of our guests because we're doing this 1,000 mile running thing here, and I'm not where I should have been in January, but I'm already a tenth of the way through the thousand. So I think I'll be able to. You know, it's only February. I should be able. To I mean, fresh that. starts. Anything could be a fresh start. So right. new day, new week, new month. We just started February, so yeah, get a fresh start in February. Yeah. Speaking of fresh starts, today we had Ethan Brooks on the show. Ethan, I feel like this was a pretty fresh conversation and episode um, comparatively to a lot of our other ones because Ethan works at The Hustle. Some of you might be familiar with that. And uh, he really like brought an energy and a specificity to the conversation that I mean, just not a lot of people are able to bring. He, he, he does something that is very unique. What do you think about um, about the conversation that we heard? Yeah, for sure. He's like in the thick of it. So every day he's researching uh, a ton of new different business ideas, different content models, different ways to approach, um, you know, business online, right? So I think there's a lot of different takeaways. But one thing that I, I specifically thought was interesting was the fact that he uh, narrowed down different ways to think about media and different ways of packaging it. So you have this, you know, his specific specialty is newsletters. Um, but within that, there's almost a funnel that he references and he he talks about. And so that was helpful. And then if you zoom out, even when he was talking about his job, he didn't say it was writing content or, you know, making content. He said a large part of his job is researching. And I think if you, if you look at content in general, um, most of it, most of the time that we spend making content is actually um, cultivating ideas or researching or finding out different things and, and breaking down these models. Uh, and then it comes time to actually produce it. And I think some people look at the part of like, like, oh, this is a newsletter, or this is a, a podcast, but really it's the formation of those ideas. That's the hard part and really the thing that takes skill. How about you? Yeah, I, I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was a, a really... Um unique conversation, but to, to what you were just talking about, I think I've, one of my challenges going back to what we we're talking about is I'm trying to write, you know, for 30 minutes each day and uh, as a personal challenge and, and to follow some of the things that Ethan even talks about in this episode. And it is super hard because I'll come to a part that I want to write about. And I'm like, I just don't have enough information or enough ideas formed yet in order to do this. So then it causes me to read, which is great. Um, but that is so much of you're right. He, he, I think his job title, like technically writer or some type of, and most of what he does in the day to day is research, which sounds awesome. Um, but, uh, he, that, that sounds like uh, such a fun, um, interesting day to day job. And, and so Ethan talks about all of that. He talks about what it's like to work at the hustle. And he talks specifically about how, if you're interested in starting a newsletter to what you were talking about, Carlton, what that funnel needs to look like, what, how many people do you need to have? Um, what is your free, uh, content need to look like, and then how can you eventually start charging for it? So I think it's a really good conversation. Let's get into it with Ethan Brooks. Today's guest is Ethan Brooks, editor at The Hustle. The Hustle is a media company that makes it easy for you to make smart business decisions fast, and they most famously do this through their daily email that gets delivered to over 1 million people every single day. Their paid trends, subscription, and the popular My First Million podcast. 
Ethan joined to talk about the details behind building a content brand, including how newsletter funnels work, what kind of audience is actually required to make a living online. And we got into a bunch more. If you've ever been interested in making content creation your entire career, this episode is really tailor-made for you. We also got into some predictions for 2022 and what has Ethan most excited in the content world. So I really enjoyed this conversation with Ethan. I think you will too. Let's dive in with Ethan Brooks from The Hustle. All right, we've got Ethan Brooks. Uh, Ethan, thanks for joining the show. Thank you for wading through that ridiculously long (laughs) six-second intro that Riverside makes us sit through. At this point, it's an honor. I just, uh, I listened to the episode with uh, Sonny earlier today and you guys mentioned the six second thing. So now I feel like yeah, it's, it's, a thing. it's part of the experience. Yeah. It's like yeah, the green room. Know. We need to get Riverside on that, but it's just this uncomfortable amount of time. Anyway, uh, we're very excited to have Ethan with us. Ethan is a writer at The Hustle, or I guess now part of HubSpot. Is that right? Um, yep. And yep. you're specifically at Trends, you said, right? Yeah. Yep. So what, what does that look like? What's the day to day at, uh, as a, as a writer for trends? Oh my God. Well, I can't believe it's a real job. First of all, I mean, I joke <laughs> about this all the time, but like I, uh, well, my big joke is I always say, I'm worried Sam Parr, the founder is going to show up at my door one day and ask for all his money back. Cause he realizes <laughs> this isn't a real job. Um, it's, it's fun. fun. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. So for anybody who doesn't know trends is, um, is the, the kind of the paid arm of the hustle. So the hustle is a free daily tech and business newsletter, and it goes out to somewhere between one and 2 million people a day. Trends is a slightly more specific paid newsletter um, that deals exclusively with like emerging business opportunities. So my mm-hmm. job all day is to sit around and basically research emerging business opportunities interview cool entrepreneurs and like write about how they build businesses. So it's ridiculous. That's so cool. Yeah. It's, it's like what a lot of us do, you know, in at night or what, well, not of us who are nerds, uh, do that <laughs> at, at, at night, but you get to do it all day long and, and, um, get to, I'm sure meet incredible people along the way. Yeah. Well, it's a blast. I mean, it, it, it basically creates situations like this. So uh, it's a real, it's a real treat to be able to do it. And, uh, you mean you talk about the business nerd thing and that's kind of where it came from. So Sam Parr, I mentioned founded the hustle and he used to just like you said, do this on nights and weekends and like just find interesting companies. I know you used to work for Vayner media. So there's a, yeah. like an old uh, breakdown that Sam did where he was just like trawling through all these old interviews with Gary trying to piece together. Like what, what, how did, how fast did that company grow? How'd their revenue grow? And he would just do this in his spare time. And eventually he's like, you know, I think there's got, there's like, there's something here. I think people would either yeah. pay for this or they'd like to be part of a group that kind of focuses on this. And that's actually where trends came from. So he just threw it out there. He's like, hey, I do all this research on different businesses. Is anybody interested in this? And it kind of over the years gave, gave rise to trends. So yes, it's very so nerdy, cool. but like business. Nerdy. Yeah. You got our roots deep in the business nerd space. Yeah, it's awesome. One more question about trends that just popped in my head. So I've been a subscriber for a, a couple of years, um, but I deleted Facebook. So I feel like I might be missing out on part of it. But isn't there, there's a pretty good uh, Facebook group component to it as well, right? Meeting other other folks who are involved and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, so, yes. And we catch, we catch hell for this all the time, man, because a lot of people are like, oh, oh Facebook. I, and yeah, and yeah, I yeah, get I'm it because sure. I was too. Um but yeah, there's, like, there's this crazy group. What we say all the time is like people come for the newsletter, but they stay for the community. There's this, mm-hmm. I don't want to, I don't want to oversell it, but it's a cool group, like really cool, just entrepreneurs. I mean, you can, I guess, speak to it maybe a little bit different uh, given whatever your experience is. No, been, yeah, but- it was great. And it was a great experience. I would say if you like my first million, which who doesn't, it's like the Facebook group version of that. I mean, it's, it's that happening. Um, uh, on a regular basis. And, and trends is like the less off the cuff, uh, more scientific and actually researched version of it as well. I would say <laughs> if, if I had to put a thing on it. So yeah, very, very cool. Love that you, uh, were, were willing to spend time with us and, and join us. Um, and so we kind of got connected because you heard some of the stuff that we talked about with Preston Holland, who is with flying media, flying magazine, and, uh, and, and also kind of connected to, Craig Fuller, Freight Waves. And so um, part of what makes all of them so interesting is they're using all these new media forms uh, for 
you know, some other, some other industries maybe that aren't as interesting or people hadn't paid attention to for a long time. And, uh, along with that trend, I would say there's another one that is just doing, everyone has a newsletter, right? Like everybody's found a way to, to make whatever they do interesting enough to be able to have a regular newsletter. Um, and this is something that you've written about extensively. So I want to ask you kind of two parts to it, but the first is, you've broken down the operating models for newsletters. How should people be thinking of that if they're if they're thinking about starting a newsletter or they have a newsletter? Um, how do you break that down specifically? Yeah, great question, man. So I think at the highest level, I guess maybe just to give some people a little bit of context, a couple of years ago, we yeah. noticed what you were saying, which is um, newsletters as a business were becoming more and more popular. The Hustle had been doing it for probably five to six years, somewhere in there. But, um, you know, in the last year or like 2020 specifically, you just saw like all these acquisitions and uh, companies like Substack were taken off. Everybody, uh, lots of sort of mainstream journalists were leaving mainstream publications to start their own paid newsletters. So we just mm -hmm. noticed there was a lot of interest. Um, and so we actually set out to kind of write the definitive guide on how that industry works. So uh, I was lucky to be kind of the lead researcher on that project. We spent... Uh, six months interviewing people from all over the industry, like not just our team, but also um, like, you know, first hires at Morning Brew and people who are running different departments mm -hmm. at WAPO and just uh, like the founders of Substack, like all over the place and uh, really broke down what are the nuts and bolts of how this works. So with that as background, or actually, I should probably just cap that off and say, and then we were acquired and we didn't have to like end up publishing this guide. So not, most of it hasn't seen the light of day except through those Twitter threads. But at the highest level, I think there are two ways to look at newsletters. The first is as like a marketing medium, which is, I think, traditionally what people are more used to. So you build an email right. list and you use that to sell products. The second, which is what we're kind of talking about here, is this new age where the email itself is the product. And mm -hmm. that's, I mean, that's what we can dive into deeper. We'll break down what the business model for that looks like. Um, but yeah, at the highest level, I think people need to start by making that distinction between whether they're, if they're going to use email, uh, if they're going to build an email list, are you using the list as a means of marketing something else or uh, is it the product itself. And the reason that's important is because as we get deeper into this, we can talk about like numbers, how big your audience has to be, stuff like that. And yeah. the size of the audience is going to change a lot depending on what your actual goal is. So we can, we can get into that. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, let's just dive in. So, so I think most of the, most people are pretty familiar with the marketing version of it. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that's, you can, Correct me if I'm wrong, but that could be an audience of five, right? Like that, that, that is just the audience is what it is. You might be on the way up building it. It's more when it comes to making that the product that, and that's the question that we get very often from customers or, or folks in the space is just like, how big do I need to be in order to really think about this as something significant? Uh, so, so when it comes to that, when it comes to building the newsletter as a product that you're, you're building a business around or as a part of your business, how do you start to think about that in terms of when a number is appropriate, et cetera? Definitely. So I'm going to give you two answers. Um, okay. One is going to feel like a cheat. But it's but it's the real answer, which is it depends, <laughs> right? And it always depends. Right. I'll give I'll give concrete numbers too in a minute. But here's the the reason why it depends <clears throat> is that there are three different ways to make money on a newsletter as a product, right? So and this is what we found by talking to all these different founders in the space. There are basically three ways to monetize a newsletter business. You have free newsletters, which are monetized via ads or affiliate deals. You have low cost subscriptions and you have high cost subscriptions. And they basically work mm -hmm. <clears throat> to form this like newsletter funnel or what we call the, the, the newsletter engine where your free email is kind of the, it's the easiest one to grow because there's no barrier to entry. So you grow that audience and you monetize it with ads. And then it also becomes distribution for paid products that you develop down the line. So you have low cost subscriptions, which are, I mean, like trends is an example, a little bit more specific than whatever your free newsletter is, 
and not super expensive. And then you can develop high cost subscriptions on the back end of that. So again, just to kind of give people the high level overview, the way the business works is you build free free newsletters first, which you're trying to monetize via ads. Because of that, the audience typically has to be a little bigger. And then as that grows, you have the opportunity to build these low cost and high cost paid products. And the low costs are typically called a front end product. High cost is back end. So you have free front end and back end, and that's how the business works. Now in terms, so that's the, the reason it depends is because inside of those models, there are a number of different levers you can choose. So let's just, we'll start maybe with free newsletters. Cause I think this is where most people start. Sure. Um, if you're building an audience in a free newsletter, <clears throat> and as I said, the goal there from a business standpoint is to monetize it with ads. There are basically two different types of ads. You have display ads. So you're, you're basically saying, hey, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to go to Casper Mattress and I'll say, hey, I send this newsletter to X number of people and I'll charge you $5,000 or whatever it is to be in the newsletter. Mm -hmm. That's the first type of ad. The second type of ad is affiliate ads. So um, I think a lot of people are probably familiar with those, but you basically sign up you get and you get some sure. kind of kickback for however many of their products you sell. Um, when you're building a free audience that you're monetizing via ads, I find it's helpful to break these things down as like principles rather than numbers. Principles first, because if you understand the principles, uh, you can kind of choose your own path. So... For a free audience, sure. there's like three levers uh, at play in terms of how you're going to be able to monetize it. Uh, and those are how big is your audience? How engaged with you are they? Like, are they actually taking action based mm -hmm. on what you say? Because you can have a huge audience, but if they're not really listening or doing anything, it doesn't matter. And how much money do they have to spend? And that last one is probably the most important because you can have an enormous audience that's incredibly active. But if they don't have any money to spend, it's going to um, impact everything else in terms of what types of products you can advertise to them, what types of paid subscriptions you can build down the line. So how big is your audience? How engaged are they? And how much money do they have? And here's the deal. You only really need two. So when you're looking okay. at this is, and I'm bringing, I'll bring this full circle now. When I say it depends how big that audience has to be, this is why. Because if you have a small audience that's incredibly engaged and has a lot of money to spend, it doesn't have to be that big, right? But, mm -hmm. um, so that's, and like I said, those different- uh, No, those are great questions. Yeah. So- Yeah, I, I really like those questions. And I like the fact too that the two out of three, because like if you, let's just take the one you just said, the small audience, highly engaged, has a lot of money. There's, there's multiple things within that, right? Like the marketing angle then is probably a really strong potential because like if you have a service to provide, you have a really engaged audience that trusts you and they have a ton of money to spend, bam, there's a ready-made uh, audience for you to, to sell against. Or conversely, like you're saying, there might be another brand who's, who's interested in that. So yeah, those are great. For sure. Yeah. And then just to, I mean, make it even more concrete for people in terms of numbers, like to use the example like the one you're using, I have a friend who has an incredibly niche newsletter um, specifically focused on people who own photo booth businesses. And it's not big. I mean, it's like, wow. yeah, somewhere around a thousand subscribers. That newsletter generates okay. more than six figures a year in affiliate revenue because it's a small audience, but like everybody in the industry knows it, right? And they're yeah. I was gonna say, how are there more than a thousand people who own those things? That's that's <laughs> got to be a good size of the market share. There. Yeah, it can't be too many more than that's a thousand. Awesome. Um, <laughs> and and you know they're buying things for their business, which makes them a little bit less cost uh, sensitive. So, anyways, you can see how those levers can play out at like different extreme ends of the scale. You can have an incredibly small audience with a lot of money to spend, and as long as you're reaching them with the right products, you can make a great living on that. And we may talk about this a little later, but I actually think that's where a lot of the opportunity still lies in newsletters. These are like really niche followings. Okay. On the other end of the scale, you have people like Morning Brew and The Hustle and these like The Skim, these huge audiences who have relatively high income, relatively active. Uh, very hard to compete against them these days though. And there are people who are making a, a go at it. But again, I think they're 
like the most successful opportunity in that space is either super niche or like you need some kind of angle. But what does it look like in terms? Can I let me just ask you? Sorry, one more no, question on that. Let's say that you have a mixture. Um, like I feel like there are some of these legacy lists. People have like random lists from you know before GDPR or whatever, and so they're they have these massive lists that they've maybe accumulated over 10, 15, 20 years. And the engagement might not be extremely high based on a number of factors, where they got it, how often they've used it, et cetera. But it could be, you know, a, a list of high net worth individuals or businesses, and it's huge. What's a play for for those types of people where your engagement might not be, because isn't engagement kind of key for something like this? Yeah. <clears throat> so it's one of the three levers, right? So if you, let, I mean, the example you just gave was it could be a huge list of high net worth people that isn't super engaged under the framework, that's still probably quite valuable, right? Cause you have two of those three things, large list, lots of money to spend. Mm -hmm. And so you probably could start marketing to that list immediately um, and see where it goes. Now, that being said, I mean, to dive into the specifics, I've seen stories of people who have tried to warm up lists like that by only marketing to small segments of them uh, at a time. And the reason for that, this might be a little too specific, but I'll get into it for a second, is, you know, in addition to the size of your audience and stuff, um, these email servers are paying attention to like how many of your recipients actually open the email, how many are marking you as spam, et cetera. Uh, yeah. So if you have a really uh, disengaged audience, you're trying to kind of start a business around, it can be a good idea to market to segments of them first so that the... Uh, the sort of the statistics work in your favor. You're not seeing incredibly low engagement rates and then you just sure. warm them up over time. Um, but yeah, I mean, to, yeah, great yeah, to that example, I think that that could work. Um, generally speaking though, I think people have th this same question comes up all the time. There's kind of two things, which is one is like how niche is too niche. And the other is how big does my audience need to be before I can start selling ads. And I think, the framework we just talked about is a kind of a good one um, for thinking through this. Mm -hmm. At a general level, though, like when you break down the kind of standard CPMs for ads in this industry, if you're looking for like a super simple number for a general purpose free email that you want to make six figures on in ads, you need to be swinging 50 to 100,000 subscribers minimum. Earlier than that, there are probably better ways to make money than via display advertising. And like one option mm. would be that affiliate advertising. Um, as I mentioned, that's kind of the two sides of the ad coin. The beauty of affiliates is that a lot of times those programs are self-serve, so you don't necessarily have to sell somebody on it. And also um, they're entirely performance-based. So most companies don't care how big your audience is. Right. It's like if you can if you can land a sales, we'll pay you. Yeah. You could have two people on your email list. I don't care. So affiliate sales are often the best place. I love that. So just just to go for it. Just yeah. to break that down for maybe people who because I, I feel like those are a little bit old school and I love that you're bringing those up. Uh, but maybe some folks haven't haven't uh, experienced that. But back in the day, especially you would jump on whoever, Amazon, any any retailer, really uh, web retailer, grab their affiliate code um, and then it, really for the most part, it was on your site, right? So if you had like a content site or something like that, you could uh, throw the code on there. And as your audience would come and interact with your site, interact with your content, if they clicked on the ad uh, and bought anything from the affiliate, you would receive a, a piece of that. And that's essentially how it would work within your, with your, in your email newsletter as well. Is that, is that kind of right? Basically? It? Yeah. 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 Effectively. Um, and there are a few good resources to look at for people who are interested in this. So you mentioned one, which is Amazon. Amazon's probably the most famous at this point. Um, but there are some huge sure. publications that make lots of money on affiliate deals. So one, you're probably most people familiar with um, NerdWallet. And I, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. They, and for anybody who's listening and hasn't heard of them, they basically have a bunch of content around, you know, basically like how to choose a credit card. And they do affiliate deals for these credit card companies. Well, NerdWallet did $245 million in affiliate revenue last year. It's insane. It, yeah. Um, so affiliate can be a huge business, especially if you're smart with your content play. 
and a couple of places to check out. So the, uh, one of the leaders over at the Motley Fool gave us a couple of tips on this. Rakuten, which is a affiliate network, uh, R-A-K-U-T-E-N. That's one place where you can find like high quality right. affiliate deals. Uh, and another is great. share a sale. It's another great place to find like high quality deals because there's plenty of affiliate networks out there that are like low quality too. So you want to steer clear of those. So those are two to right. take a look at if you're interested in casting a, a broader net and seeing like what else might be available to you. That's great. And we'll link those both uh, or th- all three of those in the uh, in the show notes below. I think that those are some great tidbits on the newsletter front. If if we had to flip it for a second to more broadly this um, this creator economy, which you know has been a buzzword for a while. There's positives. There's negatives. Uh, I think it's cooled off a little bit, but especially marketing folks tend to be very um, attracted to this because it's like, oh, finally, this is the stuff that we do. Like, is a, there's an economy around it, you know? And so sa- same question or similar question. I know you've done a lot of work around uh, how the solo or micro creator, you know, career can can happen. Um, maybe just give us a, a little bit of an idea of how people should be thinking about that. And then again, do you need to have a million followers on Instagram in order to, to make that a reality? Or how, how does that work? Yeah, sure. So um, the great news about the newsletter research is that that model that we were talking about a minute ago of free front end, back end, that actually applies pretty much universally across this creator economy. It's kind of a useful way of thinking about all of this. So as I mentioned, you have, you know, your free audience, which you're building. And we talked about that in terms of a newsletter, but that could be your Twitter audience. It could be your TikTok audience or something like that. It's better if it's email because you own it, but the reality is you're just trying to develop this group of people who are paying attention to you and taking action. Uh, And then, you know, I mentioned like low cost and high cost paid subscriptions, but that's not necessarily limited to newsletter work. I mean, that could be a paid community. It could be a paid uh, course. So if you learn to think in terms of this model rather than just like one, um, product type, I think it's actually beneficial because it'll help people continue to uh, adapt as like these new distribution methods come out. So the the good news is that same model can be applied. And I think a lot of the same rules apply. So no, you don't need an enormous audience as long as you have, you know, two of those three levers. And uh, Mm -hmm. Tim Stoddard and I broke this down recently. I think there's kind of a trajectory that we see people following again and again and again in this creator space. And it goes something like this, like it's three steps. The first is cash flow, which is basically how are you going to pay the bills while you build this creator or content style business? And if you're a marketer mm-hmm. inside an existing business, I mean, this is still um, important, right? What are you going to do to pay everyone's paycheck day to day as you build the influence that you need to be seen as like a, a voice in your space? Um, sure. Yeah, so cash flow first. Then you have that trust and influence phase where you're building your audience and 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 kind of showing people that you know what you're talking about um, and that they can trust you for recommendations and stuff like that. And then the third stage is uh, products. And I, again, this could be paid subscriptions, it could be courses, it could be communities. And one thing I just want to point out about these for anybody who's thinking about this from a business standpoint is that um, the benefit of a paid product is not just that it makes money. Uh, Specifically, when you're comparing something like a free newsletter versus a paid newsletter, the big difference between those is actually that the paid newsletter makes uh, recurring revenue. And that's important Mm. because selling ads can be a gigantic... Can I curse on here? Or no, yeah, selling ads can be a pain in the ass. Like if you sell a million (laughs) dollars worth of ads this year, that's great, but you got to go do it all over again next year, right? More if you want to grow. If you have a paid newsletter though, sell a million dollars worth of subscriptions. If half of those people stick around for a second year, you start the year with 500 grand in the bank. And then if you still, if you sell another million, right? If your capacity to sell doesn't grow at all, 
the business has still grown by 50%. So this concept mm -hmm. of recurring revenue is really important. Um, and it carries over to these different maker models. So yes, absolutely. Transitions. Uh, no, you don't need a huge audience. And that's kind of how you think about it. Cash flow first, trusted influence, and then products on the, on the tail end. Yeah, I, I really like that uh, framework. I love the trust and influence part. I think that's probably the one that I think cash flow is like a little bit obvious or, you know, people naturally think, how am I going to pay the bills? What am I going to do? Um, but especially for the folks who are in an organization, uh, it can be easy to be like, okay, we're we're okay. Like we're making money. We're, our organization's making money or whatever. And so, okay, let's start like figuring out how to make products. And, uh, and that key middle piece gets left out so much, so much of the time. Uh, and I think it's, it's probably fairly obvious, but what are some of the, just quickly, some of the, if you have any good examples of, of people who have really built that trust and influence well, um, or just how that can be done. I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but just, just curious, uh, where you've seen that done. Yeah, sure. So, uh, are you more interested in like a brand or an individual creator? Uh, e either one. I just think it's, it's, uh, yeah, it'd be helpful to hear from, from, from you when it's worked. Yeah, sure. So, um, I think on the individual creator side, one of my colleagues, Steph Smith, is actually one of the people that I admire oh, the most. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know her. It's like she's done a great job of doing this. And what's interesting, I think, about Steph, for anybody who's listening to this, is that she's always had a job, right? So I think there's this temptation mm -hmm. in our industry, this like entrepreneurial space, to strike out on your own immediately and like build your for own sure. thing. And it's helpful to know that you can do this with a with a job. In fact, the job is that cash flow component up front. It can be really, really helpful. So Steph's done an incredible job of this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and she's so. Yeah. That's a great example. Yeah. Yeah. And then, I mean, there are others too. Like I think um, James Altucher is a really interesting case study in this model. In fact, he's one of the guys who helped us really crack this. He was very generous with like his time and insight. And he's built his newsletters doing something north of $20 million a year. Just his, yeah, sure. his newsletter business alone. Um, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, I think also, so, uh, for people who haven't heard of him, he's got, you know, one free newsletter that's monetizing via affiliate deals. Then he's got like, I think two or three front end newsletters that are somewhere between one and $400 a year. And by the way, in terms of the price point on those, the idea is to price them right in that zone, like the 50 to two or $300 a year. It's kind of an impulse buy, not a super huge mm -hmm. Uh, payment. And then he's got these back end newsletters that are like $5,000 and up. And I'll give you a third example, which is kind of related. So Altature's business sits underneath the umbrella of um, Agora Publishing. Are you familiar with them? Yeah. N only James. I, I, I didn't realize that was a part of something else. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, that's actually common. So Agora is like, they've got to be doing more than a billion dollars a year in content sales, wow. but it's really interesting because, uh, you would almost never know you were buying from them, right? Like they've done a very good job of okay. creating this umbrella of smaller imprints that all have their own like individual creators and stuff. And they catch a lot of heat because for two reasons, one, their content is, I would say like on the kind of the far right end of the spectrum. And so okay. it's quite like, uh, it, it, it elicits an emotional response from anybody who reads it, right? Sure. The other reason that I think they uh, catch a lot of flack is because, and this is sort of related, they write killer copy. Like their yeah. whole funnel is incredibly well-tuned. And so whether you like them or not, I think you can learn a lot from that company and how they've set things up because uh, it's just a super well-oiled machine. Now, yeah, they definitely have some like shady sales tactics and need to be held accountable for that. But in terms of how the business model works, they're a really good example of somebody who's making this model work at, a, at a, like an incredible scale for somebody that most people never heard of, right? Oh, very cool. I'm excited. I've never heard of them personally, so I'm excited to, to dive into yeah, that. Uh, yeah, myself. check them out. That's awesome. Well, yeah, those are, those are great. Uh, I think frameworks and ideas for, for people to uh, latch onto. So appreciate that you sharing those. Um, I want to just get a little bit more on you. I think again, what you're doing is so interesting. You just have all these models and like, how did you get into 
this did, let me ask you this when you were um 12 in connecticut or whatever and you're like watching sports where you're like one day i'm gonna study businesses uh for a living was that like the goal were you a darren Ravel fan or something like that back in the day <laughs> i um <laughs> who's darren Ravel? maybe that answers part of the question oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> no, well, that answers the question. He's like the OG, like Joe Pompliano is probably the new Ravel. Oh, right if you know, I'll have to check you know him Joe. out. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would say, I would say a large part of it was luck, but from a very early age, it was something that I wanted to do. I had no idea how to get there. I lucked, I, I really lucked into this path, but I've always been a little bit entrepreneurial um, and dabbled in business. I actually started my career as a freelancer and. Uh, so I, I did freelance web dev for like the first five cool. or seven years of my career. Um, oh, significant amount of time. Yeah. And so I've always kind of been in this like startup area. And then a couple of years mm -hmm. ago, I was um, doing basically developer relations work at a startup, hyper growth startup called TopTel. And uh, it was a really cool team, really cool project. But uh, my grandfather passed away and I realized I always wanted to be a writer and I wasn't like making progress towards it. So it was just one of those moments where I was like, I got to change something. And I sure. uh, left that job with, without really any plan on how to get here. I just kind of knew at that time, like this is an important time to do something. Um, and hacked together a living for like nine months, still just freelancing again. And it was Steph actually who reached out to me and said, Hey, we're, you know, she had gone straight. We, we worked together at TopTel and she had gone from there straight oh, to the okay. hustle and they were hiring for a writer job. So yeah, it was kind of this crazy, um, story of like, you never really know where that like kind of life changing opportunity is going to come from. And I've tried to yeah. figure out how I'd replicate it. And I, I honestly can't, I it just got really, really lucky. Um, but that's, yeah, that's kind of yeah, a high level story. I'll have to uh, sometime off off air share. We have a very similar, some very similar uh, parts of our story, but but the people listening to this are, are tired of hearing about this <laughs> story, so we'll have, to, we'll have to share this some other some other time. Um, last couple of questions here, and really appreciate you uh, you spending the time, Ethan. Um, first is just like what's what's got you excited? What I mean, you know, you work for trends. What are some of the trends? What are some of the content ideas, et cetera, that have you excited as we're now you know partway through the new year here? Yeah, can I give you can I give you two? One is um sure. I'll give you two content related trends. One is one that I'm excited about, and the other one is one that I think is being overhyped. And the reason I want to share them is because okay. I think they're both maybe a little counterintuitive. So the one that I'm so ex I'm super excited about is magazines. I actually think magazines are coming back. I publicly mm. uh predicted this this year. I think this is gonna be like the year of the magazine. And two years from now, everyone will be starting them. Uh <laughs> Everybody here who's listening, you got if you haven't heard the episode with Preston yet, you got to go back and listen to it. What they're doing over at Flying Magazine is fantastic. Long story short, there is a major inefficiency in the magazine market that entrepreneurs are uniquely suited to solve. And when like when they start figuring it out, specifically e-com owners, everyone is going to be buying magazines. In fact, I interviewed mm -hmm. Preston recently and the quote that he left me with was if you're like running one of these businesses, whether it's an, an e-commerce business or something like that, and you're not thinking of buying a magazine, you're leaving money on the table. So I'm really excited about magazines. Mm. I think they're coming back. Also, weirdly enough, I don't know if you have seen this. We wrote about this at The Hustle, but like vinyl had its best year last year in a long, long time. Same thing with print books. And get this, um, direct mail. So direct mail... Really? Yeah. Direct mail is now more effective than like ever before in part because no one's using it anymore. And here's a weird ah. thing for people in the U S like one of the leaders in direct mail innovation is actually the U S postal service. They have this crazy mm. site. I think it's called like, uh, immersive mail or interactive mail. They're like deep in the VR space. So this like old, outdated government bureaucratic <laughs> system is crazy innovative on the direct mail campaign. Uh, I oh, yeah cool. encourage marketers to check it out. And then that's actually happening overseas too. Um, okay, so that's what I'm excited cool. about. 
Well, can I just, but I would just want to say, so all of those things that I would say the common thing is like they're analog, but I would imagine you're, you're, you're implying they have to be like incredibly high end, right? Like the, the magazine is like a tabletop book or something, or the direct mail is, um, not a flyer from a dealer that's on like nasty, right? That's kind of what you're implying in, in the fact that it's going to come back or maybe not to some extent. So to tie this in with what we've talked about. There are, a, like, when you look at magazines specifically, there's a few different ways that they make money, right? One is subscriptions, one is ads. And then there's kind of this third thing similar to email, which is, like, you can use them to promote other products. So in the case mm. of Flying Magazine, and he's been public about this, uh, you know, Preston and Craig, they have this magazine focused on pilots, and they're now also building this entire real estate development with, like, fly yeah. properties, and they so own, cool. yeah, which is awesome. <laughs> and they literally own like the most trusted outlet for f- like flying news in the world, probably. So it's this mm-hmm. huge mm-hmm. marketing lever. Uh, they, to, to your point, they are making it an incredibly high end experience. And I, I do think there's something to that. Um, but generally speaking, I think the other reasons that magazines have like a lot of potential right now is... Um, one, among the people who still read them, there's like a lot of trust built there. And this is what Craig and mm-hmm. Preston found. Initially, they had thought of like shutting down the magazine when they bought the brand. Um, but they just found like, you know, this thing's been around for almost 100 years. Tons of people love it. It would be crazy to, to walk away from that, right? So if you can find a brand that people have loved for a long time, I think there's a lot of value there. But also there's like all these new tie-ins. And this relates to direct mail as well. So like voice integration, which I had never thought of, you can now place Mm -hmm. ads in a magazine with an Alexa command printed on the page. And so somebody's flipping through it and it says, you know, Hey, you want to buy this new keto wine? Just say, get me dry farms, like Siri, get me dry farms wine. Oh, that is right. Yeah. And so now there are different ways to make the ads more effective and then also to track that effectivity or effectiveness much more reliably than old magazines. So I think magazines are going to be able to monetize at a higher rate than they used to be able to. So I think there's a lot there. And yes, you know, part of it is, is definitely that reader experience. If you can take that up a notch, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Do you subscribe to any magazines? I, uh, well, the, I have a GM, uh, truck. And so they send me, the guy, they, yeah, they send me this magazine every month. It's called Boundless, and it's it's cool. I don't like. I don't know that I would pay for it. It's beautifully done and everything like that. But no, I, I don't have any magazine subscriptions aside from that. But I'm I'm a I'm a uh, I'm a laggard. I need to get on the ball. You know. Well, actually, that's uh, that's interesting because it actually does kind of beg the question. Like, if you don't have a magazine subscription, is that because you're a laggard or because you're like digital first and you're you know, at the, at the leading edge, yeah. but I was the same way until literally three months ago. And I'll tell you, this is what switched my, what changed my mind too. I was just really overwhelmed with all the digital content and I live in this world. Right. Mm-hmm. And I was just right, lo- right. like looking for something high quality that I can read without staring at a screen for more hours of the day. And so I recently signed up for wired and I'm going to add, I think I actually also signed up for Nat geo. Um, but cool. when I actually, that was the moment for me where I was like, yeah, I think there's actually something here. Like people want something physical. So that's the one that I'm excited yeah. about. All right. Return of the mag. You heard it here for first from, uh, from <laughs> Ethan here, January 22. Um, and I apologize. I cut you off there. What was your second idea uh, or second thing you were really excited about? Oh, so this is the one that I think is maybe a little overhyped and marketers. Okay. Oh, right, right. Marketers are either going to love this or hate this, but uh, SMS marketing. I think, mm. I, what do you think about it? What's your thoughts? <laughs> I, so we've had a guest on shout out Kenneth Burke who runs text request. Uh, and so I am, I'm pro it for what he does. And I think they have a great brain, but, um, as a consumer again, and I, so I'm being consistent. I'm just a curmudgeon as a consumer. I opt out whenever possible of, uh, of, uh, from text marketing. I'll say that. So I think I have a similar outlook, which is um, I think text marketing can be incredibly effective, but I don't think, and like 
there are some great tools out there. Uh, I haven't heard of the one that you just mentioned, but I have nothing against the platforms that are building in this space. Sure. But I don't think most companies are prepared to really make this work. And I like, again, this only comes from my uh, sort of lizard brain reaction as a consumer. I hate when people text me and I didn't ask for it. Um, and I've yeah. got a couple of brands that are doing this now and it makes me like, loathe them with a fiery passion. So I feel like here's who I feel I like could really capitalize on this. I think creators, small creators have a mm -hmm. huge opportunity there. If you, if you're the kind of person who's building this like one-to-one -one relationship and you're willing to put the effort in to be incredibly personable, like it's gotta be like a, sure. yeah, but I think your average. Yeah. Brand, I would say my old, I mean, Gary V is the, is the case for this, right? Like is in there texting all hours of the day, et cetera. I would also say Apple could make this flip this on its head where it would be an, an enormous opportunity if they allowed just the simplest bit of organization within texting. Texting is such a wild west that I'm like you where I hate, I mean, I have 98 unread texts right now that, and it'll just always sit there. You know what I mean? Like 50 <laughs> is the, cause it's just a mess. Uh, I can't mark unread. I can't file. And so I, I, I totally agree with you that unless something significant happens on like the infrastructure on the platform level there, I, I think, um, it's, it's, a, it's probably a little bit overhyped as well. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. I'm, I'm curious to see where those Good things predictions. go. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Well, Ethan, thank you so much uh, for spending your time with us. Thanks for jumping on the show. Um, where can folks, I know you're, it seems like you're doing a pretty recurring podcast. Uh, so where can folks find you or follow you and, and keep up with what you're working on? Yeah, so I think people uh, sh should check out, well, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at damn Ethan, damn underscore Ethan on Twitter. Uh, and you can, it's in the show notes as well. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you can check us out at trends, trends.co. Um, or the hustle.co if you want to catch the newsletter. And I appreciate the time, man. I'm really uh, enjoying going back to the archives of this show. So it's a, it's a real pleasure to be on it. Cool. Cool. Thanks for coming on, man. Sure thing. Mm -hmm.